Hi, welcome to Life is a Leaf. Recently a film called Planet of the Humans came out um, and it was directed by Jeff Gibbs and narrated by Michael Moore. And I wanted to make a few comments and I know many, many people have commented. Most of those comments have been debunking uh, or negative about that um, film or occasionally using that film to push new right agendas about uh, the disastrous fraud of green energy. Um, Sky News uh, produced one like that and they have a video out called uh, Michael Moore to do a documentary uh, exposes green energy as a fraud. Now, of course, that was always going to be a worry if you're going to critique green energy at all. But there may be some point for um, people on the left and environmentalists to do some self-critique. Jeff Gibbs's film has basically three threads to the film itself. And the most central and most important is that human beings are already a geological and meteorological and biological force on this planet, such that we have changed the weather, that we have affected oceans and mountains and the climate and uh, severely affected the biodiversity of the planet. Now, that point um, is, in my mind, pretty irrefutable. I'm a scenicologist, uh, and so I know this to be the fact. An important point within that is that he frames this as an impact of human population. He basically makes the point that was made in Limits to Growth and in many other places, that if you increase your population continually, eventually you will run into limits. And to press the limits to growth, without going into any of the detail that they did, um, basically their book said that if you increase the population of any animal, including human beings, um, and simply allow growth to continue, that it would uh, ultimately run into one of two limits, or maybe both limits. The one is the ability of your closed environment to absorb waste, and you end up drowning in your own shit, or the ability to extract resources you need to keep your population going. The second of those is, from a biological standpoint, um, not to say that populations will completely uh, vanish, that we would go extinct, or the basic biological idea is that you move into overshoot and collapse, where you, you have overshot the environment's capacity to sustain your population. And at that point, you have often done damage to that environment's ability to sustain your population. And so your population collapses. You see that all the time biologically, where, for example, if you have a really, really good year, perhaps the elk are increasing population to the extent that they actually damage the forest. And at some point, they have so many children because you've had such a good year and things turn and autumn comes and you've run out of uh, food and you've damaged the forest itself and so the population begins to starve and collapse. And at that point, perhaps, the wolves find they've got a huge number of elk and they will 
increase their own population because they can, because there's plenty of food there, there are plenty of elk there, and they're not doing very well, they're unhealthy, and so it's much easier to get them and kill them and eat them. And so the wolf population might increase. But as the wolf population increases, it needs more food, and so it kills even more elk, elk and uh, and till eventually that population has collapsed, and then the wolf population starts to collapse. And this is these are examples of both uh, the way populations can run into overshoot and collapse, and also the interlinking of various events where you have feedback loops. Um, now, I will go into that in a later video. I won't do that right now. And at the moment, I will go on to Gibbs's second point. And his second point was that a lot of uh, renewable resources are not actually the answer. He makes a few different points here, aside from the fact that he trashes solar and wind. One of the points he makes is that technical fixes always come at a certain cost, and there are limits to how good a technical fix is. And this is certainly true. Technical fixes will help you out, but ultimately, if you keep increasing your population and you keep putting demands on that new technology, you will come to the limits of that technology. In my mind, he made that point less well than he might have. I would have made the point in stronger relationship to the fact that uh, our technologies of energy and uh, petroleum use and coal use and all of these things have enabled us to increase our population greatly, to increase our ability to extract resources and provide for that population, and increase our ability to uh, develop new technologies and, and uh, power new technologies. And these have all allowed our population to increase and increase to the extent that the waste products of that technology have started to poison our closed system, which is pretty much precisely what Limits to Growth said happens. If you come up with a technical fix for that, like renewable energy, that may uh, solve some of the problems of that pollution by you know, uh, changing the nature of the waste and pollution we're putting out. Um, it's like when London went from coal, which was creating huge problems with smog in the city, uh, where everybody had a coal-fired heater or boiler or grate in their house, and they cooked with coal, and all of the particulate pollution basically caused huge health problems, and ultimately um, a lot of wood burning and coal burning was banned within the city of London. And that was possible because of technological advances where you have a coal-fired power plant outside of London and electricity uh, to power light and heat and all of those things. And London has become much cleaner and allowed uh, a much healthier population and a much greater population. Solar and wind and other renewable energy may indeed allow us to uh, reduce the CO2 going into the atmosphere and help address global warming and the problems of pollution from carbon uh, sources of energy. But ultimately, if you keep 
than increasing your population, you will run into other problems. There was a scientist in 1960, I think it was, I think that was von Forster, who predicted, he said he was an optimist. He believed that we would always find a technical fix. Human beings would always find ways to provide a technical fix and allow the population to keep growing and we would not starve to death and we would not uh, die of pollution. We would increase our population until we were crushed to death. Now that was um, obviously a semi-humorous article but in many ways it was serious in the way it was pointing out the problems of overpopulation. Anyway, population was one of the major points and through lines of Gibbs's film. The second major point in Gibbs's film, in my mind, was that renewables aren't actually providing the benefits that we believe that they are uh, providing, that they are not as clean, that they are uh, unable to provide more energy than they consume. And we can divide this into two parts, and several critics have. I, I personally liked the critique of Let's Have a Think, where he anal analyzes um, the renewables particularly solar and wind, and the technological advances that they have gone through in the last 20 years. Um, he looks at Gibbs's film and points out uh, that many of his film shots and examples are from 15 or 20 years ago, and that the technology has improved. This is certainly true. More importantly, he looks at the technology as it should be looked at and does some analysis of cradle to grave, which is, you know, includes the cost of the energy, the cost of uh, transporting the devices, the cost of building, the cost of maintenance, the lifespan of the material and the cost of disposal. Now, all of these things, I mean, Gibbs's film looks at wind generators and goes, oh my God, look at all the cement they're using. Look at all the steel they're using. Well, yeah, okay, they use a lot of steel and they use a lot of cement, but look at a power plant. When you build a coal-fired power plant, you know, you're using a hell of a lot of concrete and steel and so on. He looks at the uh, some of the older uh, wind farms and goes, oh my God, these didn't last forever. Well, every bit of technology has a lifespan and coal-fired power plants don't last forever either. Um, and it is a mistake to think that they do. Every technological thing has a life it will exist for a certain period of time and if you maintain it well the lifespan can be extended but ultimately there will come a point where you know you have to decide whether you're actually going to rebuild the thing or get rid of it recycle it do whatever dispose of it in some way take it down and build something else now i think there are a few issues he didn't touch on. He touched, as I say, he touched on the cradle to grave thing, which is really um, an appropriate way to look at it. But what I think neither he nor the Gibbs film touched on is the fact that uh, you also need to look at the difference between centralized solutions, big technology, and decentralized or small technology. And there is a difference between having a huge solar array somewhere 
and feeding it into a grid um, and uh, putting it out that way or having solar collectors on a roof or on the walls of a building in an urban environment and using the uh, energy at point of origin or as close to point of origin as you can get. And this is important in a few different, uh, for a few different reasons. One of the central reasons is that um, the use of big technology is something that corporations have latched onto. When a lot of uh, the push for renewables came out, companies like oil companies and mining companies latched onto that and they created their solar visions and their solar visions were things like uh, putting solar arrays in space and beaming the energy down in microwaves and into a field of receptors that would be kilometers in diameter. And, um, and this allowed them to get a lot of money in grants and if any of this actually came to pass uh, and, and there were other plans like um, ocean thermal things where you had huge rafts that sink pipelines deep into the ocean and use the differential in temperature. Now, these sort of things are huge technical fixes run by corporations for corporate profit. And they make people vulnerable to technology. They allow control of technology. Whereas uh, decentralized technologies, solar collectors on a roof, hot water heaters, solar hot water heaters, um, backyard wind generators, they allow people a lot more freedom. Now there are arguments that they may not ultimately be as efficient as these big projects, that there are economies of scale in this sort of thing. Um, you'd have to look at what exactly the economies of scale are and what are the actual economies of scale in building maybe small wind generators uh, versus large wind generators. Now, technologically, that has a lot of aspects. One good point about large-scale wind farms is they can be located in an area where there is more or less constant wind. In Australia here, that could be along the Great Bight where you get a lot of wind along the south coast of uh, Australia and there are very few um, cities and towns there so you are not having too many problems with uh, po human population. Now it may have some impact on animal populations but uh, yes you don't have a pro the problem of human populations. On the other hand you have the issue of transmission lines. And transmission lines are not perfectly efficient. You can lose 10% typically uh, from a coal-fired power plant to a city. The longer the lines are, the greater the line loss. And the more dispersed uh, a reticulated um, system is, the more expensive it essentially becomes. And this works to the extent that in Western Australia, which is a very uh, sparsely populated, very large state in Australia, um, they had what the electric companies called black lines. And black lines were lines that basically didn't make any money because the cost of putting them in and the cost of maintaining them was greater than you would ever make from the very few uh, consumers that were out there. 
And so the energy companies in Western Australia adopted a policy that they would start to take down the black lines. And I think Victoria also was doing something like this and offer um, people in more isolated rural areas uh, enough money to set up a solar uh, or wind um, or diesel uh, remote area power system or RAP system. Now, those RAP systems in WA, uh, I was involved with looking at and, and evaluating some of them. And in particular, there was a company that was making variable access uh, wind generators. Now, a variable axis wind generator is one that instead of sitting there and having the blades go round and round, um, as or being upright and having the wind, the blades go this way, it would face the wind, and as the wind got stronger, it would tilt upward until it was it became virtually a vertical axis uh, wind generator. And this meant that it could deal with a lot higher wind stresses, and so it could have much bigger blades, and that meant it could also draw energy from uh, lower wind speeds and come up to full power in a fairly light wind. And this is really an important thing. Now, what we also discovered was that for most remote area power systems, the best uh, system for people in an economic sense was to have a battery bank so that your wind solar system could provide your energy in most situations. But to have a diesel backup generator, um, that would allow you, if you had a situation where you had very little wind or no wind um, for an extended period of time and very little sun, that uh, you could use your uh, diesel generator. Or if, for instance, you had a whole lot of friends or family come around and the energy demand at your home was suddenly much greater than normal, you could supplement your system with the diesel generator. But that the batteries would be enough to handle most situations without the diesel generator. This was important because you know, uh, deep discharge batteries are expensive. And if you need enough deep discharge batteries to power the, your home, your ranch, or your station in all circumstances, then you will need a huge battery bank. But if you need only enough battery, uh, batteries to power it in most situations, you can get away with a much smaller battery system. And that's an important thing. And this has applications in larger scale power systems as well. So the idea that you have a backup isn't really as problematic because you know, if you have to have a huge battery system, well, batteries are another form of technology. They have a lifespan. They take materials. They take energy to produce and so on. And if you can get away with using a lot less of them, um, then this may be better um, to have a diesel backup or a uh, coal-fired backup or whatever, some other kind of backup system that uses fossil fuels than not uh, having that thing and trying to go entirely on renewables. Of course, this is also contingent on battery technology. Now, if battery technology markedly improves, yeah, uh, then you know, things can change. Perhaps you get to a point where you can get all of your power renewably. But um, this, again, needs some calculation uh, in terms of the efficiencies and 
the full cradle-to-grave cost of the various components of these things and the consequences in terms of pollution and so on of using various other systems. I mean, for example, one of the things that we were looking at at one point was lithium bromide batteries with a thin film and this would make for a much lighter battery and it would potentially be able to recycle or re recharge the components in this battery because um, they were liquid and uh, some of them precipitated out but they could be re-suspended uh, by putting in more electricity. Um, one of the only problems with that is, is bromine is quite toxic and you know uh, yeah you end up with a different set of problems. Um, all technology has problems. All technology has strengths and weaknesses and all technology will produce some sort of pollution and problem and the question is what is the best one? And again, um, cradle-to-grave analysis, proper technological analysis, is the way to work that out. And basically Gibbs's film didn't do that. He did mention cradle-to-grave somewhere or other, but uh, I think that was basically to say, oh my God, you know, renewables use materials. They use energy. They have a lifespan. So does everything else. And the uh, cradle-to-grave analysis that uh, was shown on Let's Have a Think uh, basically showed that renewables are much better in terms of inherent energy and uh, energy use uh, to energy production. Um, they're far better than coal-fired power plant or petroleum power plants or nuclear power plants. I mean, nuclear power plants are a complete disaster. Uh, Gibbs didn't look at the issues of centralized versus decentralized technology. Um, and part of that is about making money. He didn't really look at capitalism except to say capitalism is a bogeyman. And I'll get to that in just a moment. Um, now, in my mind, capitalism is a bogeyman. And one of the big problems, we were talking about economies of scale in large scale versus small scale power plants. Well, if you're talking about solar collectors, you might get economies of scale because you're buying many, many, many uh, solar collectors or po possibly you're vertically or horizontally integrated and your own company is effectively making these things so you know your profit margin you know can come in anywhere but individual consumers will be charged a premium uh, that is not being charged to large-scale com consumers and some of this may be because of the additional costs of transport um, some of this may be because of the cost of organizing uh, a large-scale uh, installation versus uh, organizing, putting solar collectors on individuals' roofs. But a lot of it is just profit motive. And if you had a government which actually had a policy and could carry it out for the well-being of the citizens, to say people should have, we should have uh, decentralized power because for one thing it's much less vulnerable, mm. then you could say, you know, the, we will be building this many solar collectors and it will be the same price whether it goes to a centralized institution or uh, an individual and you know, whatever other costs there are, like transport or installation, will be covered separately. Now, that 
it raises the question of socialism and command economies and that sort of thing, which you know, are valid things to be raised. Um, capitalism ultimately is a problem. Um, so basically Gibbs, is, Gibbs was unfair to solar and wind, which are seen as the two major renewable energy sources. He was not particularly unfair to the whole notion of biofuels. And biofuels is a bit of a situation where uh, governments and corporations have used the language and some theories of sustainability to promote this and call this your renewable solution when it's nothing of the sort. They're really just chopping down forests. And let's just have a think was very good in saying that uh, a lot of environmentalists over a fairly long period of time have pointed this out, that this is basically another atrocity uh, to the environment, that this has huge impacts, that not only is it a, not a sustainable thing, that it is um, something that has huge impacts on biodiversity, for example, that it has an impact on our carbon sinks, and so on. In Tasmania, where I'm living currently, we see similar things where they talk about renewable forests and sustainable forests as plantation forests. And while that may be sustainable in a sense, it takes time and energy, and they've started to have to fertilize and put pesticides on their newly growing forests. And so you've got all kinds of inputs that have, and what you're reproducing is not a forest in the you know, uh, typical historical ecological sense, you're producing a plantation. And they have decided to try and take more and more old growth forest and use that. and. Quite typically, uh, industry has tried to find ways to justify exploitation and to work out ways not to have to take real action or ways to profit off of what really should be uh, a concession to the environment and a recognition that you cannot continue to just destroy the environment in the way that we have. Now, the third element in Gibbs's film was really a takedown on environmental activists. And some of that may be, to some extent, justified. But I think the motive there was essentially to portray himself as an iconoclast, as doing the, the thing of, oh, all these, you know, celebrity environmentalists, they're all corrupt, they're all bad, to fit into that narrative and to position yourself as being the revealer of the corruption, the revealer of the evil of these celebrity uh, environmentalists. A lot of that is not fair. Um, I have my own issues with uh, McKibben. I'm not a fan. I think he doesn't do very good analysis. I think he, his solutions are really problematic. And I may go into that on some other video sometime. But uh, if what has been said about him uh, is true. He embraced the um, biofuels solution briefly in the beginning and then basically rejected that and said I was wrong uh, and has opposed it. 
Now, to the extent that's true, he's clearly not in line. I don't think he's out there profiting from corporations. I don't think he is yeah, uh, hand in glove with corporations in some sort of corrupt way. I think that's a presentation people do a lot. The idea that there are donations from bad organizations, you know, Monsanto and uh, petrochemical companies, Exxon or whoever. Well, yeah, but Exxon and Monsanto and all these people, they go out of their way to donate a lot of money and it doesn't necessarily have strings. To some extent, it's a public relations exercise on their part. They say, oh, look, we're trying to do some good. See, we've donated to these people. There are arguments about the morality of that, but the realities are that a lot of uh, NGOs, non-government organizations, are not well off. They don't have a lot of money. Um, a number of them are shoestring operations, and they get money wherever they can. Um, there are, of course, bigger organizations, and these often become problematic because they do start considering funding bodies and what they can say and what they can't say, uh, and the importance of funding. I'm, I'm reminded of the Australian Conservation Foundation, which um, at one point was dealing with a, a really wide range of environmental issues and worked a bit as an umbrella organization for a lot of smaller organizations. Um, and then at some point they decided they needed to consolidate. They didn't, weren't, they were tired of working on an entire shoestring. And so they decided to focus on one or two big campaigns and leave the rest of it to, I don't know, someone else. And I think this is problematic. And I think one of their the problematic issues of that is fundraising became much more important than dealing with all of the environmental issues. And this was a shift. And a number of people who were really excellent uh, people, I'm, I'm thinking of Dr. Mark Diesendorf, who went on to form the Institute of Sustainability. Um, but he was working for a long time for very little for the ACF and doing wonderful work on energy and urban planning and taking a holistic sense and a holistic look at energy use. And this was really valuable. And his demise basically meant that nobody's looking at that much anymore. Um, issues like that are problematic with big organizations. I mean, organizations like PETA, uh, which has prioritized fundraising to the extent that they haven't really promoted a vegan message, and for many years they were promoting you know, uh, reduction and, and all kinds of half measures, baby steps, as they say, and used really questionable uh, advertising techniques in order to you know, maximize their income. And yeah, there's problematic issues and I may touch on that at some point too. Okay, so there are those three elements. The one is population and the limits to human growth. The second is, and, and that in my mind is fair enough, although it wasn't well enunciated. The Second issue was renewables don't work effectively. Uh, and this was a combination of basically uh, inaccuracy. I'll, I'll say inaccuracy rather than 
misinformation. And partly it was justified in the case of biofuels. Anyway, the third element was basically a takedown inv on environmentalists. And I see that as unfair, basically, in many cases. I don't think it was well analyzed. It was basically saying bad. Um, and again, I don't think it was fair. Now, I think a lot of that stuff was, uh, was well dealt with in Let's Just Have a Think. Uh, I know many other people have also dealt with these things. Um, I'm just using them because I actually thought they did a pretty good job um, of analyzing that film. But I have some issue with Near the End, where uh, Dave from that channel um, basically tried to deny the issue of population. And this, to me, as a cynecologist, is almost criminal. And it fits right into what's going on a lot in the left, uh, the denial of population as a problem. Now, I understand partly why people might not want to highlight population, overpopulation, as an issue. And the major reason is that it is an issue which is used by racists um, and people who are trying to stop migration and uh, basically to um, engage in a bit of lifeboatism, uh, to use Ger the Garrett Hardin uh, analogy. The boat's going to sink, we're all going to be in lifeboats, and some countries are going to be in really well-stocked, wonderful lifeboats, and other countries are going to be in really crowded, poorly stocked lifeboats, or floating in the ocean, and if we take too many people, or we try to help out those other people, we'll just lose lose uh, our food and resources and we'll all drown. Now, yeah, I don't believe in lifeboatism. I think it is criminal and also unfeasible. Yeah, the notion of lifeboats, we're not on lifeboats, we're on a planet. And we're all on that planet. And um, things like climate change affect all of us. I, they're not lifeboats, they're just countries, they're just areas. They're areas with imaginary lines around them, and those lines are policed by guards and armies. And uh, the people within them have more resources because they have taken them, often, from someone else because they have exploited other countries, because they've engaged in colonialism, because there's a long history of that, and they've built up their resources, often at the expense of other people. And that's why they have a lot more resources and can get away with that sort of thing. But when the shit hits the fan, um, those resources aren't going to last. U.S. imperialism does keep going and trying to take and command resources around the world. That's what their military adventurism is mainly about. That's another topic, again, for yet another video. The main point is you know, uh, that lifeboatism is never going to work. We're not on lifeboats. We are on a planet. We are all connected. All life on that planet is connected. Uh, we don't have the ability to separate ourselves out. We're all humans, all animals within this sphere of life. Hi. Back in a different venue, there were a few remarks I didn't make very well and some other things I wanted to add. Um, it was after midnight when I was doing the video last night, and so I'm back in the daytime. 
I wanted to talk about Jeff Borlas from Just Think About It in near the end of his podcast. He used the maps from Our World and Data. And the first map he used showed um, people's use of agriculture and arable land. Uh, and he highlighted India, and it showed that if the world ate the way India did, the, um, they would only be using 22% of the arable land on the planet. But if people ate uh, like the people in the US, they would already have uh, superseded the total amount of arable land. Um, the number was 137, uh, he rounded it to 140. Now, I can understand, and there is a good point there, that overconsumption can be a big issue. How people consume, and the fact that in the US they consume huge quantities of food, um, yeah, and often, I will say here and now, very high grade levels of food. They'll eat a lot more meat and uh, dairy and so on, and those are very land intensive forms of food. Jeff made the point that all of the people speaking about population uh, were from America, the over-consumers, and they were talking about the need for uh, to recognize that there were limits to population growth. And somehow he conflated those two points. Now, the fact that people in America are heavy consumers of agriculture and people in India are not has less to do with um, arguments about population than about lifestyle and expectations. Uh, you can see the wealthy have always tended to overconsume. I mean, one only needs to look at Henry VIII, who died of effectively one of the, the major factors was his massive consumption of meat and incredible obesity, which didn't do a thing for his health. This really has nothing to say about arguments about population, because in India, whether people do eat less um, and may eat a lot more plant-based food instead of animal-based food doesn't mean that they don't want to eat more or that you know, the result isn't in part because of uh, simple unavailability of food for a lot of people. There's a lot of poor people in India and uh, there are people who are hungry in India. Now, there are people who are hungry in the United States, too. And that's an utter shame, particularly given their statistics of consumption. But the point is, it's not as if this is an argument about population whatsoever. Dave then goes on to uh, show a map about energy use and, uh, and CO2 production and points out that in Africa, you know, they have high levels of population in India, population growth, and, and yet they produce very little uh, proportionally of the CO2. And this is true, but they don't produce less CO2 because they have a big population. There is no causality there. And Dave didn't really say there was, but what precisely was he arguing there? That because high population countries don't produce a lot of uh, carbon emissions, don't use so much energy, that 
therefore it's okay to increase the population, that doesn't actually parse. And it also overlooks the fact that these countries would like to consume a lot more energy. And in India, for example, between uh, 2007, 2008, and 2016, 2017, the per capita consumption of uh, electricity doubled. That's, it doubled in nine years. And the consumption of diesel uh, or fuel oil, uh, petroleum oil, and coal went up by 50%. In China, uh, in the 25 years between 1990 and 2015, the consumption of energy went up uh, by effectively six times the consumption for Asia, excluding China, doubled. So the fact that these countries are poor and haven't been able to consume high, high levels of energy doesn't mean that they wouldn't like to if they could. And it doesn't mean that they, they consume good energy. Uh, it doesn't mean that they consume energy in any kind of renewable way. The issue here is not to draw uh, improper conclusions from correlation. In there's the famous example is that in the United States, African American communities have a high level of crime, and people use this to try and say race is the reason that this occurs. And that's basically a form of racism. And any kind of sociologist or generally statistician who actually looks at that stuff critically says there is no causality between race and, uh, and crime. The causal um, factor is that uh, there is poverty. And poverty is correlated to crime in a causal way. Now, African-American communities have been subject to racism and structural inequality for a long time, and that's why there is inequality there. A lot of poor countries in the world have been exploited fairly heavily by the West, and that's one reason the West is rich, and uh, a lot of countries in Africa and Southeast Asia and uh, other parts of the world are not. And the poverty in those countries has resulted in low levels of energy consumption. In India, uh, a major source of fuel is a form of biofuel, cow dung, still. That's changing, but as it changes, electricity consumption and other forms of energy consumption is increasing dramatically. If there is any real connection between countries in Africa or Southeast Asia and low levels of consumption of food or energy, the issue is poverty. The, there is a different kind of correlation between high levels of consumption and low birth rates. Basically, it has been noted that as countries develop and become more wealthy, and particularly as women have more options, birth rate often falls with an increase in the standard of education and the standard of wealth and so on. When you are more certain that all of your children are going to survive and do fairly well, people tend to have fewer children. So. Most of the point, I, I, I'm not sure, other than the fact that, yes, you know, the West is our flagrant consumers of energy and food, and that shouldn't be the case. I'm not sure what point Dave was trying to make, but the conclusion certainly is not that uh, population has anything to do with consumption. 
as population increases, consumption increases. As nations in poorer countries develop and become more wealthy, the rate of consumption increases. The rate of consumption, for example, in China of dairy, which has always been extremely low, has increased markedly in the last couple of decades, the rate of consumption of meat, because meat and dairy are associated with wealth. The conclusion we should draw is that, yes, we need to rein in consumption. This doesn't mean we don't need to rein in population, because population ultimately ties into consumption, whether on a per capita basis we're consuming a lot or a little. We still do need to worry about population. The fundamental point uh, of Gibbs's film, the first point that there are limits to uh, human growth, the human population growth on this planet, there are limits to resource use, is certainly true that there are limits to how much of our garbage, of our plastic we can dump into the ocean, of our air, airborne pollution we can pour into the atmosphere. We can't just keep doing this. Um, I mean, interestingly, uh, neither Dave nor uh, Gibbs um, or much of anybody else in talking about agriculture, everybody overlooks one of the major factors, which is that animal agriculture is a huge problem and that we could uh, basically um, have a huge amount of arable land made available to uh, agriculture if we stopped using animals, if we stopped using more and more land and forest and resources for milk and eggs and mammals that we eat. If we stop doing that, um, it would free up a huge amount of agricultural land. And for our current population, there would be certainly enough currently. Now, if we kept our population growing, even by going vegan, we would still run into the problem that ultimately there wouldn't be enough. And with our current agricultural processes, our mechanized chemical agriculture, we are actually destroying arable land at a horrific rate. But again, that's a different issue. The thing I want to say is that while Gibbs's film was unfair to environmentalists, while he misrepresented wind and solar, uh, although he was accurate about biofuels. Um, his point about limits to growth is true, is a valid point. And in that sense, this may be an important film. Okay, well that's all for today. Uh, I hope that you like this. Um, I may start making this channel more active and posting more videos. I've talked about a few videos that I might want to do. If you like it, yeah, subscribe. If you tell your friends, you know, because nobody even knows about this channel. I've done almost nothing. Uh, if you like it, tell me you've liked it. Um, okay, thanks very much. May you all get through this COVID mess. Um, be aware that uh, a lot of the opening of borders is basically a, a, a notion that we can open the borders and you know, we have enough ICU capacity so that those we can make better will get better and those who will die will just die and that's okay because mostly those are just old people or sick people. Um, that's a really heartless idea, and if you happen to be in the older category, 
the useless or the unwell category, if you have any health problems, if you have cancer, if you have anything like that, if you have a transplant which would require anti-rejection medication, um, then you know, you're in trouble because opening it up and saying people can die, well, that's a way of reducing population, but I think it's a pretty bad one. I think uh, I personally subscribe to the uh, voluntary human extinction um, idea. Let's live long and then go extinct. Uh, we don't need to kill anybody. Um, we don't need to sacrifice anybody. We don't need to sacrifice the poor or the old or anyone else. We're all in this together, really. Okay, thanks. Thanks very much. Thanks.